Hello. This lecture is for ISOL 633. This is for the textbook Legal Issues in Information Security. This chapter is the American Legal System. Just this chapter briefly reviews the legal system in the United States. It's important for Americans to have a general understanding of this system. It affects us every day. We are bound by a system of laws that regulate our behavior and contribute to an orderly society. Laws are a reflection of our values and they evolve over time. The American legal system, its history, and its processes are a fascinating area of study. Many talented judges, attorneys, and law scholars have written excellent books about it. This chapter provides only an overview, but it will outline the framework that can enable you to do further reading and research on this topic. So the learning objective for this chapter is to identify the basic components of the American legal system. The topics we will cover include how the American legal system is organized, what the sources of American law are, what the types of law are, what the role of precedent is, what regulatory authorities are, what the difference between compliance and audit is, and how security, privacy, and compliance fit together. Key concepts we'll look at are the components of the American legal system, the code law versus common law, categories of law, how precedent affects the law, and again, security, privacy, and compliance, and auditing. When you complete this chapter, you'll be able to describe the American legal system, explain sources of law, distinguish between different types of law, explain the role of precedent, describe the role of regulatory authorities, explain the difference between compliance and audit, and describe how security, privacy, and compliance fit together. The components of the American legal system. We have the federal government with a legislature, executive and judicial, and we have state government. So the federal government, U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1789 and sets forth the structure of the U.S. federal government. Representatives from almost all of the states in existence at the time work together to draft the Constitution. The state representatives realized that there were some areas in which a strong federal government was needed in order to keep the states united. However, the state representatives didn't want a federal government that was too strong, nor did they want any one proportion of the federal government to have too much power. These considerations help explain the current structure of the federal government. The U.S. Constitution calls itself the supreme law of the land. It's the fundamental authority for the American federal system of government. Constitution defines three co-equal roles in the federal government, legislative, executive, and judicial. The legislative branch makes the laws, the executive branch enforces the laws, and the judicial branch reviews the laws to make sure that they are constitutional. This is the checks and balances system that describes the relationship among the three branches of the federal government. Each branch of the government has a separate sphere of authority. Those are the balances. The actions of each branch of government are subject to review by the other branches, and those are the checks. State government. In negotiating and drafting the U.S. Constitution, 
state governments gave up some of their own power in order to create the federal government. They did this because the first system of government after the American Revolution was originally under the Articles of Confederation and it didn't work. That document didn't create a national government that could require unity on subjects of common interest. The U.S. Constitution changed that relationship. Under the Constitution, the federal government has certain state of powers and responsibilities. Powers that are not specifically granted to the federal government in the Constitution remain with the states. The Ten Amendment, the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution formalized this relationship. The Tenth Amendment states, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. State governments existed before the federal government as we know it today. Like the federal government, most states are organized under a constitution. State constitutions may vary widely from the U.S. Constitution. Although the federal constitution primarily describes the relationship between the federal government and the states, state constitutions primarily describe the relationship between a state and its citizens. For this reason, state constitutions often list many more individual rights than are listed in the federal constitution. State constitutions also tend to be longer than the federal constitution. Finally, state constitutions are generally easier to change than the federal constitution. Next, we'll look at the three branches of the federal government. So the legislative branch. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution sets out the lawmaking authority of the legislative branch of the federal government. Collectively, the legislative branch is called Congress. The federal government has limited lawmaking power. Congress can't make any laws outside the scope that the Constitution specifically delegates to it. U.S. Congress consists of two chambers, the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. The Senate has 100 members, two senators from each state. The Senate represents all states equally. The House of Representatives has 435 members. The House represents the population. Each representative represents a congressional district. Congressional districts all have roughly the same number of people. In November 2013, that number was 710,000 people. The congressional districts are redrawn every 10 years after the U.S. Census is completed. Each state gets at least one representative, no matter its total population size. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution lists the powers delegated to Congress. Congress has the power to delegate war, establish the post office, maintain armed forces, and coin that is print money. In addition to these very specific powers, Congress has the power to regulate commerce, make other laws necessary for carrying out its constitutional duties. These powers are very broad. The Commerce Clause grants Congress the power to regulate commerce between the states. Congress uses this provision as justification to regulate trade or any other commercial activity between the states. Many Supreme Court cases have reviewed the limits of this power. In general, if any activity has the potential to affect the trade relations between the states, then Congress is able to legislate it. The Executive Branch Article 2 establishes the power of the executive branch of government. 
The President of the United States leads the executive branch government. The President is a nationally elected official. The President is also the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Armed Forces. The President is awful, often considered the face of the United States. The President has the power to enforce the laws of the United States and the responsibility of maintaining the day-to-day -day operation of the U.S. government. The President has the power to sign or veto any legislation that Congress passes. Congress can then override a presidential veto with a two-thirds vote of the House and the Senate. Once the President signs the legislation, it becomes an act of Congress. An act of Congress is a law passed by the Congress and signed by the President. An act of Congress is federal law. The President also appoints federal uh, judicial, executive, and administrative officials. The Senate must approve some of the President's appointees, such as the cabinet members or federal judicial appointees. The President also has the power to negotiate and enter into treaties with other countries. The U.S. Senate must ratify those treaties. The role of the U.S. Cabinet is to advise the President. The Cabinet includes the U.S. Vice President and the heads of 15 executive departments. President George Washington established the first Cabinet. The Constitution recognizes that the President should have advisors and executive departments, but it doesn't specify the type or number of executive departments. Congress creates the executive departments. Then the judicial branch. Article 3 of the Constitution establishes the judicial branch of the federal government. This article vests the, the judicial power of the United States in one Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court is the highest court in the country. The U.S. Supreme Court is the only court specifically regulated by the U.S. Constitution. Currently, there are nine Supreme Court justices. Congress has the authority to determine the num actual number of Supreme Court justices. The president nominates a justices when there's a vacancy on the court. The Senate must confirm the nomination. Supreme Court nominees are usually highly respected state or federal judges or highly respected attorneys. Supreme Court justices, like all federal judges, are appointed for life. They serve until their retirement, death, or removal. Supreme Court justices can be removed only if they are impeached and convicted by Congress. The Constitution requires that all federal court judges be appointed for life for a reason, to help promote an independent judiciary. The drafters of the Constitution didn't want the review of law to be dependent upon popular political ideas. Instead, they wanted the federal judges appointed for life so that they couldn't be fired if their decisions were unpopular or not favorable to a particular political party. The U.S. Constitution also defines the relationship between the federal government and the states. At the time the Constitution was drafted and ratified, people debated the appropriate relationship between the federal and state governments. In the previous legal document that established the federal government, the Articles of Confederation were too weak to keep the states joined together. However, an overly strong federal government was seen as an obstacle that would prevent states and individuals from controlling their own affairs. The states wanted to make sure that they retained the authority to control their own affairs. The Constitution contains specific provisions to reflect this divided authority. The Constitution also provides some of the fundamental rights of individuals. Individual rights are located primarily in the Bill of Rights, which was ratified in 1791. The term Bill of Rights reflects collectively refers collectively to the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. 
News amendments are the basis for some of the personal rights that Americans hold most dear. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and the right against self-incrimination. So different types of laws. The laws, the law isn't secret, but it's complicated. Many of the processes and procedures in the law have evolved over time. There are a combination of the will of the federal and state governments, longstanding traditions about right and wrong, and society's values. It's no wonder that finding out what law applies to particular situations is sometimes puzzling. This chapter has already discussed several sources of law, U.S. Constitution, U.S. federal law, state constitutional law, and state laws. Now it's time to put these sources in context for the American legal system. This section describes the general sources of law and how they're related to one another. So common law. Common law is a body of law that's developed through legal tradition and court cases. U.S. common law is a body of law and legal principles inherited from England. Common law changes very slowly. It develops as judges decide court cases. Therefore, it's sometimes also known as case law or judge-made law. In the common law, courts decide cases by referring to established legal principles and the customs and values of society. You also look at decisions made in earlier cases to see if the cases are similar. If the cases are similar, the new case should reach a similar result. Finally, formal principles of law and reason are used to help reach a decision when the result is unclear. Code law. Code law is law that is enacted by legislatures. It's also sometimes called statutory law. This is the written law that is adopted by governments. In its truest form, code law attempts to state the complete system of law for a state or federal government. Citizens and members of the legal profession are all bound by the terms of the written law. In the United States, in most states, the common law and code law work together to form the laws that society must follow. There has been a strong movement within the law to codify the common law. Many, many states have codified their common law criminal principles into written law. Some states also have codified parts of their civil non-criminal laws. Once the code or statute provision is made, that addresses the common law. It supersedes the common law in that area. The principles and traditions of common law are transformed into a code of laws. Constitutional law. The U.S. Constitution is the final source of authority for issues involving U.S. federal laws. When federal laws are disputed, they are subject to scrutiny to determine whether the law is constitutional. If the law isn't constitutional, it's invalid. If the law is constitutional, then it's the source of authority for its particular subject matter. Similarly, state constitutions are the final source of authority for issues involving state law. So long as the state constitutional provision itself isn't in conflict with the U.S. Constitution or federal law, then it will be the final decision on state laws. If state law is constitutional under both the state and if challenged U.S. Constitution, then it's the source of state authority for its particular subject. Civil law. Civil procedure deals with the procedures and processes the courts use to conduct civil trials. Civil trials concern claims between individuals. Substantive areas of law, such as contract law and property law, are civil law areas. The parties in these types of cases must follow civil procedure rules when bringing disputes to court. 
the federal courts. The case begins when a complaint is filed with the court. The complaint is a court document that sets forth the number of parties and facts and legal claims. This is how the, legal, the lawsuit begins. In the federal system, the rules outline the civil trial procedure are found in the federal rules of civil procedure. These rules are made by the Supreme Court and approved by the Congress. State courts also have rules for how civil trials are conducted. Often state rules are based upon the federal rules of civil procedure. These rules were last updated in 2010. Most civil trial cases must be proven by a preponderance of the evidence. This is the lowest level of proof in the civil case. Preponderance of the evidence means that it's more probable than not that an action or wrong took place. While simplistic to express the standard as percentage, preponderance of the evidence means the probability of an action having of taking place is greater than 50%. Some civil cases, such as actions to terminate parental rights under the clear and convincing evidence standard, meet this standard, a party must convince the court that it's more likely than not an action or wrong took place. Criminal law. Criminal procedure deals with the rules that courts follow in criminal law cases. It also includes the processes for investigating and punishing crimes. The federal and state governments have criminal codes. These codes specific specify the actions that constitute a crime. Crimes are wrongs against society. Crimes are prosecuted by the government against an alleged wrongdoer. The federal or state official with the power to pursue criminal cases is called a prosecutor. In the federal system, the rules outlining the criminal trial process are called the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. State courts also have rules for how criminal trials are conducted. Most states have rules that are modeled after the federal rules. Most criminal law cases are tried in front of a jury. The jury decides questions of fact. The judge's role is to watch over the proceedings and decide questions of law. Administrative law. The administrative procedure sets forth the process under which administrative agencies make and enforce rules. The federal government and most states delegate some regulatory and enforcing functions to administrative agencies. Governments delegate some of these functions in very detailed ways and for very specific reasons. When governments delegate power in this way, it's possible to have an agency that creates rules, a legislative function, enforces rules, an executive function, and reviews rules, a judicial power. Agency power is a combination of the power of all three branches of government. Actions of these agencies are the focus of administrative procedure. Because these agencies are carrying out a function of the government, there must be processes put in place to ensure that all persons appearing before agencies are dealt with in a fair and consistent manner. All federal government, at the federal government level, the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946 helps define the federal government administrative process. This act states the procedures for agency rulemaking, enforcement, and review. The role of precedent. The doctrine of precedent is one of the most important traditions of the American legal system. This doctrine means that courts will look at the decisions made in prior cases to determine the appropriate resolution for new cases. For example, the U.S. Supreme Court has the power to decide cases that involve questions about the federal constitution and other federal laws. 
Supreme Court is the final authority on cases heard in the federal court system. If other lower courts in the federal system have a new case that concerns an issue that the Supreme Court has already addressed, those lower courts are required to follow the law as it has been interpreted by the Supreme Court. State courts must also follow the decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court to the extent that the state court is reviewing issues that include U.S. constitutional or federal law. The doctrine of precedent is also referred to as the doctrine of star a decisis, which means to stand by things decided in Latin. Star a decisis means that lower courts must follow the decisions of the court above it so long as those decisions are relevant to the case that the lower court is deciding. Overturning the precedent is a milestone event for the law because it changes established legal principles. In essence, it changes the rules that the judge and lawyer follow. Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896 and Brown v. Board of Education in 1954 are two cases that dramatically illustrate how precedent can change and how changing precedent can have a significant impact on society. In Plessy v. Ferguson, the U.S. Supreme Court legalized racial segregation practices. These practices were also known as separate but equal practices. In this case, Homer Plessy boarded a train in Louisiana. Plessy was seven-eighths white and one-eighth black. He sat in the whites-only train car. Louisiana law considered Plessy to be black and required him to sit in the blacks-only train car. Plessy refused and was subsequently arrested. In the Plessy case, the plaintiff argued that the separate but equal practices violated the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. 14th Amendment requires that all citizens be provided equal protection under law. In this decision, the court held the separate but equal practices such as having train cars segregated based upon race were not inherently unequal. The court stated these practices did not violate the U.S. Constitution. Regulatory authorities. As discussed in the Administrative Procedures section, the federal government delegates some regulatory and enforcement functions to administrative agencies. The delegations are usually to subject matter expert agencies. These delegations are made because it would be impossible for Congress to make timely laws in some of the many different areas that are regulated by the federal government. According to the Federal Administrative Procedure Act, the agency is a governmental authority besides Congress and the courts. Federal agencies fall under the executive branch of the government. They are used to help carry out the day-to-day -day activities in government. Agencies may have many different functions. Many of the laws in the United States are actually administrated by regulatory agencies. These agencies create rules, enforce compliance, and hand out, hand out sanctions within their specified area. The president usually has the authority, has a representative responsibility for overseeing the federal agencies. Federal agencies also can be created under other federal agencies. For instance, the U.S. Department of Agriculture oversees a number of different federal agencies. Congress also can create independent agencies that report directly to it. One such independent agency is the Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC. The FTC is an independent federal agency. Its mission is to promote the consumer protection and eliminate practices that are harmful to competitive businesses in many areas of the economy. The FTC is created in 1914 under the Federal Trade Commission Act. The FTC is one of the most important 
regulatory authorities for consumer and some business pra practice issues. The FTC reports to Congress on its actions. FTC is led by five commissioners who each serve a seven-year term. Commissioners are nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate. The President also chooses one commissioner to act as chairman. To maintain, the, to maintain the independence of the commission, no more than three commissioners can belong to the same political party. The FTC has seven regional offices across the United States. So the difference between compliance and audit. People often get compliance and audit confused. It's helpful to understand these terms because they will, you will encounter them often. Audit and compliance are often associated with illegal activities, which is why they're included in this chapter. In the legal system, compliance is the action of following applicable laws and rules and regulations. Generally speaking, the organizational compliance involves not only following laws and regulations, but also following the organization's own practices and procedures. Compliance must be documented. With respect to law, it's not enough to say that an organization is compliant. The organization must prove that it is compliant. Audit is separate from compliance. An audit is an evaluation and verification of certain objectives are met. An audit can review laws, rules, regulations, policies, and procedures to ensure that an organization is complying with stated requirements. An audit looks at the processes that are put in place to meet compliance objectives and make sure that these processes are accurate and actually followed. Audits may occasionally be performed by independent organizations. An organization also can have an internal audit function that ensures that organizations are following its internal policies and procedures. Audit is an inspection at a fixed point in time. In true and sense of the word, audits don't take place daily. An audit usually asks the question, are the rules being followed? How are the rules being followed? So in summary, the American legal system is history and its processes regulate our behavior and contribute to the orderly society. Laws evolve over time. They are a reflection of the laws imposed by the federal and state governments, longstanding traditions about right and wrong, and society's values. Individuals and organizations must follow laws, rules, and regulations Regulatory compliance is influencing security and privacy practices. Organizations must take a more structured approach to addressing information security and privacy issues in order to meet their compliance requirements. Thank you.